Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Arvidas Grishnis, who is visiting at Yale as the Joseph P. Kazikis Postdoctoral Associate in European Studies. He is a researcher at Kaunas University of Technology. Professor Grishnis's work centers on post-Soviet political identity formation in Central and Eastern Europe. Today, we'll talk with him about his forthcoming book, Politics with a Human Face, Identity and Experience in Post-Soviet Europe. Welcome, Professor Grishnis. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Let's start with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. Well, it's a book that summarizes uh, my academic work so far. To be honest, it's, it incorporates uh, some things that I was interested uh, back from my undergrad studies, and uh, it, it it just piled up and developed into into a manuscript. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, it's a book about several things. It uh, it talks about post-Soviet political identity formation, uh, how uh, did the countries, but more important more importantly, the people. Uh, who lived through the collapse of the Soviet Union or, or escaped the Soviet Union, as it was the case in the Baltic states, mm -hmm. uh, how did they f later articulate uh, their political presence, their, uh, you know, their, their, their identity, their uh, sense of self and uh, sense of uh, belonging to one political sphere or the other. Mm -hmm. So. In the region, uh, political identity uh, has an existential uh, flavor, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, people had to rearticulate their uh, their presence uh, anew, and not only their political presence, but everyday life uh, changed profoundly. So, mm -hmm. so it's very much related to human experience, everyday experience and also with various kinds of ways that uh, this experience was articulated, mm -hmm. uh, be it in, in some sort of political myths or, or historical narratives, uh, or, or be it in, in particular kinds of policies mm -hmm. that followed those, those articulations. So, uh, so this book tries to present an approach how we can better understand these processes in this Central Eastern Europe. Okay, and what, uh, what countries are you um, referring to? Well, my work uh, builds that theory or that approach uh, on the Lithuanian case. Okay, and you are from Lithuania? I am Lithuanian, okay. yes. Uh, but it then applies various aspects of, 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 of the approach. For instance, looks into political images used in various other cases, mm -hmm. such as Poland, Estonia, Ukraine, Russia, and a couple of others. Okay, you know, I enjoyed you um, use some personal stories um, at the beginning of the book, and I enjoyed reading them. So if you could share some of those with us and, and how things changed for you specifically as a young boy in Lithuania. Um, well, when I grew up in Lithuania, I, I, I was born in 1987. Mm -hmm. So just before Lithuania declared its independence in 1990, well, uh, 11th of March, 1990. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, uh, my experience of this transition was, of course, th that of a child's, but, uh, but still it was filled with uh, a sense of profound change in all sphere of, uh, mm -hmm. spheres of life. Uh, you know, my gray environment, my, you know, blog house uh, childhood was st all of a sudden filled with all these neon bright plastic colors mm -hmm. coming with cheap merchandise from the West, but com traveling through Turkey, predominantly through marketplaces in Turkey where mm -hmm. people would travel and uh, buy these cheap things and bring them to, uh, to Eastern Europe. Uh, it, it was filled with TV shows or, or films like Terminator. And, <laughs> and, and Did you have like a that. TV uh, prior to? Yeah, yeah, okay. we, we, we had those. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, so all of a sudden, you know, it, it was filled with various strange flavors, uh, uh, you know, religious movements, uh, cultural movements, all kinds of new things that, that really put one out of balance and, and, and people uh, really didn't know what to expect next. So it, it, it brought upon, uh, about this uh, very liminal, uh, as I call it, the very 
uh, fluid tra uh, transitional uh, experience from in which uh, these these identities these these uh, countries were forming. Mm -hmm. uh, so, to me, it's very important that that, that kind of atmosphere in which uh, policies are, artic are articulated, identities are articulated. This, I think it's very important here. Okay, and let's talk about the theoretical approach you take in the book. Tell us about that. Right. Well, uh, because I'm talking about what I call the human factor uh, in politics, this this experiential, imaginary aspects of of politics. Uh, you know, I talk about political mythology and and historical narratives and and uh, human experiences. Uh, I had to develop my own vocabulary in a sense, mm -hmm. and I took the majority of concepts I use uh, from anthrop cultural anthropology or, or cultural studies. And I looked first of all at the political culture and uh, the way people articulated politics and tried to explain it to, to themselves and mm -hmm. saw the world. Uh, so, so it's very much a cultural approach to, to politics. Uh, but then it, it follows into explaining how these uh, understandings, these images, these, these experiences, how they actually you know, influenced various political choices. For instance, okay. Lithuanian uh, 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 advancement towards the European Union and towards NATO was very much uh, uh, reinforced by the certain worldview that it had. Mm -hmm. the people that are okay, and in the besides the uh, besides Lithuania, were there any differences that you could see in any of the country, the other countries that you looked at? And if so, what were they? Sure. Um, probably the main difference is uh, in relation to uh, how people in, in, in different countries articulate uh, their relationship with the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So uh, in some countries, uh, you know, the relationship remained tight and remains uh, tight even nowadays with the Soviet past, with the previous uh, uh, ways of, of political culture. Um, in others, uh, there was you know, a bit of a doubt. There, mm -hmm. there was playing uh, back and forth. And uh, what uh, countries a, would, that, would those be? Well, for instance, Ukraine, which mm -hmm. only very recently made a decision and still is pulled back and forth. Right. You know, it's, uh, uh, however, uh, the very significant detail that, that I think kind of indicates that shift in the narrative is the collapse or, or, or the tearing down of Lenin statues in, mm -hmm. in the country. So uh, I might be wrong, but uh, I know that uh, there sh I, uh, there's not supposed to be any Lenin statues left in public spaces in, in, in the parts of Ukraine not occupied but mm -hmm. by, by enemy forces. <laughs> <Let's call it. laughs> um, but uh, uh, you know, uh, so so this this image of Lenin uh, all of a sudden begins uh, meaning more than just memory policy. It it means the sphere of influence in a mm -hmm. sense, a symbolic sphere of influence. So and and some countries, uh, you know, separated with with that uh, that uh, heritage uh, long time ago. Mm -hmm. Well, the most predominantly, of course, Baltic states. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, the term human factor of politics, let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. Right. Well, the, the, as, as I mentioned before, it entails that uh, uh, not purely rationalistic uh, articulation of politics. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, well, to me, politics is a human affair. We often think about it in very, very... Uh, strict logical terms. We 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 talk about interests. We talk about institutions and their their legal interplay and and things like that. As if people were not involved in <laughs> in these processes. Right. And my my effort is to show that uh, the way the process unfolds is actually structured by the way people perceive world. Right. So. Uh, through culture, through their experience, through their expectations and imagination. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the, can you give some concrete examples um, that you use in your book to show these kinds of things? Uh, yeah, well, uh, if, if we get back to the Ukrainian 
example, uh, the Maidan protests that took place in 2013 to mm -hmm. 14, uh, first of all, were called Euro Maidan. Mm -hmm. And this beginning Euro was, was important because it, it uh, indicated a certain teleology, a certain image uh, towards which the protesters were striving. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that uh, happened to be uh, what they imagined as a European way of life. Mm -hmm. Uh, which Versus was the Soviet counterposed to yes. yeah more more Soviet uh, uh, heritage and mm -hmm. uh, you know it was very obvious in uh, various uh, visual uh, representations such mm -hmm. as cartoons or or, or uh, uh, graffiti's or or you know uh, comic depictions of of the present political mm -hmm. situation inside the territory of Maidan right. so these imaginary depictions of the good, the bad, the West, the East, it, it, they structured the, the, the entire process. They, in a sense, inspired the, the movement. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one example. Right. Another example could be uh, also, well, what's, what's very important nowadays uh, uh, is the, the populist and nationalist movements mm -hmm. were very heavily uh, sim symbolism laden, emotionally charged. Mm -hmm. They are not functioning in the same way that that uh, you know everyday politics function. They they function on on uh, a very human, but at the same time very different plane mm -hmm. of, of of associative thinking, of of emotional charge, of of that kind of uh, uh, romantic uh, mm -hmm. intellectual and, and, uh, and political right, right. charge. Yeah. So are you seeing, for instance, in the instance of um, immigration, hmm. which is such a huge um, topic now, um, in terms of the um, nationalistic views of these countries in the Baltic states, how are you how is that playing into the immigration situation? Uh, well, there there have been, uh, as as you know, uh, many uh, refugees uh, mm -hmm. from from Syria were passing uh, passing the uh, the Central Eastern European mm -hmm. territories and and. Uh, uh, again, the way they were depicted, the way they were articulated, uh, uh, in a sense, shaped the way they were treated mm -hmm. in, in those countries. Uh, places like Germany opened the borders, places like Hungary closed the borders right. due to certain understandings of uh, an immigrant, of another, of difference, mm -hmm. uh, and also due to various historical uh, memory and experience. Right, right. And um, can you give any other examples of how these human factors have shaped politics, particularly in Lithuania? Well, I mentioned that uh, uh, Lithuania moved very quickly towards the West, as, mm -hmm. uh, as we call it. Uh, and uh, it, it was very much, uh, you know, uh, predetermined, uh, one could say, by the way Lithuanians imagined and understood their present situation. Well, mm -hmm. that, that was in the 90s, their contemporary situation. Uh, it, you can see it in any sources you take, you, either be it intellectual discourse, were, were basically the, uh, the way uh, the independence movement should act was discussed and, and determined, uh, or be it uh, visual representations of, of the situation. So uh, the Soviet U Union was uh, depicted as a demon, a dragon, even, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, blood-sucking beast. Mm -hmm. and, and then the West was uh, considered, uh, first of all, the homeland, uh, because it connects to a Lithuanian narrative of being, being part of the Europe and then being torn away from it, so mm -hmm. returning to Europe, the, the narrative right. of returning to Europe, but also as a Christian world, you know, in opposition to the atheist, uh, right. you know, communist mm -hmm. uh, totalitarian machine. So, so this binary, for instance, was 
extremely important mm-hmm. and, and it structured the way uh, politics went not only during the independence movement but, but afterwards as well. We, we willingly joined the European Union. Having received uh, the sovereignty, we willingly gave it a part of it away to uh, you know, participate in the European community of mm-hmm. nations. Yeah, it's fascinating um, to me how some countries, as you alluded to earlier, really embraced um, the European or Western way, while some, while some of the other countries kind of still um, looked to um, the Soviet Union or Russia for, you know, guidance. Can you speak to why some countries you know, didn't fully um, divest themselves from the Soviet Union um, while others did? Well, the way I see it, uh, there's, uh, you know, one thing that is very important is whether or not uh, the countries had some kind of political independence in the interwar period, Mm -hmm. before the Soviet uh, period. And so the Baltic states, had that and then they they constructed their post-Soviet identity Mm -hmm. based on that experience Mm -hmm. and they had a direct reference also in terms of of people actual generation of people who lived in an independent Lithuania previously and Mm -hmm. then uh, so the the narrative was of re-establishing the identity rather than constructing a new country Mm And it's important because uh, then it's, uh, you know, uh, it, it, a clear teleology, where do we go, leads to where we were, right? Mm-hmm. And we were in a, a part of European right, right. countries. And uh, another, uh, other, other countries had no such experience or had very little uh, ex- experience like that. Mm-hmm. So that, uh, in, in, it, they seem to have lingered more uh, in, in, in tight contact with mm-hmm. the Soviet past. Okay. Um, Are there any remnants of um, the Soviet um, Union in Lithuania today? Of course. Yes? Of course. In Uh, what ways? Well, uh, my book kind of tries to tackle that question. Uh, I I would say there's a general culture of Sovietism, the way I call it, Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the the post-Soviet region. And it entails several things, one being a strong emphasis on on the uh, victimhood uh, experience, on the the, uh, narratives and self-articulations in terms of of experienced violence and and Mm -hmm. some sort of sense of righteousness thereafter. Uh, and it it uh, it is true for for probably any post-Soviet country that mm-hmm. you take. Uh, another example is um, is the imitation of the Western forms of of behavior, but uh, I- I- quite a superficial imitation. And uh, there's even a broadly known uh, term for that: uh, euro remont or euro r- refurbishment, mm-hmm. if you like. Uh, which means, uh, you know, uh, taking a, let's say, a socialist co- communal flat, well, this, this block house flat, uh, and uh, adding this decorative sense of, Euro- uh, of European uh, okay. habitat, you know, mm-hmm. through, through quite cheap uh, and poorly picked uh, materials, through some sort of adding baroque to a block house, and, mm-hmm. and you know, feel, uh, things like that. that the, so creatively, let's call it, uh, adapting the Western culture, <laughs> and, and quite, quite bluntly putting it uh, as a decor mm-hmm. for uh, what is still present. Um, as a result of that, partial result of that, but also partially due to the Soviet culture itself, which is uh, which was double faced. The 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 things that were said in the newspaper Truth Pravda uh, were were completely different from what was happening on the on the ground. So right. that that uh, in, uh, kind of formed a culture where uh, formality and actuality are two separate things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in that regard, the Euro, uh, Euro refurbishment uh, type of politics uh, made complete sense right. because this is how it's pursued. Okay. So what do you conclude in your book? 
Well, my conclusions are several, and I already mentioned a couple, which is some insights into the, the way post-Soviet politics works. Another conclusion is, uh, again, that, uh, uh, that point about uh, you know, s symbolic, uh, symbolic uh, border between, uh, between uh, what I call Soviet and post-Soviet, Sovietist probably <laughs> is mm -hmm. the right way of saying it, and post-Soviet countries. My argument is that in some parts of, uh, of uh, Central Eastern Europe, uh, Soviet Union never ended, mm -hmm. or the narrative ha never transcended the the logics, uh, the Soviet logic. Uh, another point was also about a couple of uh, good, uh, positive aspects of, of post-Soviet politics, and namely, it's uh, the local understanding of the existential weight of politics. Mm -hmm. It is in the region that. Uh, uh, movements like Charter 77 uh, in Czechoslovakia, Solidarność in Poland, uh, also the Lithuanian independence movement, Sajudis, which uh, were all unarmed and peaceful uh, political movements for more genuine politics, more existentially clean mm -hmm. politics. Uh, uh, you know, they were all inspired by by the conditions that that the uh, you know societies happened to to exist in and right. i think this can be a source of, of uh, a positive change mm -hmm. in, in in the region okay thank you so much for being here thank with us for today having me. thank you for more information about professor grishness and his research please visit our website at mcmillanreport.yale.edu be sure to join us again for another episode of the mcmillan report made possible through funding from the whitney and betty mcmillan center for international and area studies at yale